Hi everyone, I'm Osman Khaled. I am the general manager uh, on Amazon Web Services for the events and workflow organization. That means I lead the product and engineering teams for services like EventBridge, Step Functions, Manager Airflow. Uh, and, and I'm here joined by my good friend, Luke. Luke, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, thank you, uh, Usman. I'm Luke van Donkerschoot. I'm a AWS serverless hero, and I'm a lead engineer at PostML. Great. Luke, always fun chatting with you about serverless. But before we get into that, why don't you tell us a little bit about what being a lead engineer at PostML means and, and, and why? how did your com company decide to move to the cloud? Yeah, there's actually quite a lot of history uh, with PostML and, and the cloud. Uh, even be way before I joined, I think in 2012, uh, PostNL uh, started moving fully to the cloud and was one of the first enterprises in Europe to do so. Uh, and I think in 2013, we closed our last data center and moved completely to AWS. And a, a fun fact is that um, AWS actually placed its uh, Dutch headquarters in The Hague because that's where the PostNL uh, offices are. We started moving towards a completely uh, in-house development uh, strategy. So nowadays we build all of our uh, software with a team of about 150 engineers at PostNL. Uh, and as a lead engineer, I lead an, uh, a team to build and design applications. And we do that in a fully, fully serverless and uh, event-driven landscape. Well, you teed up my next question super nicely. So as you know, Luke, we invented the serverless space with the launch of Lambda in 2016, and, and you were and your company were already on the cloud before that. So I think an exciting story about The Hague uh, and being in The Hague with our headquarters. Um, but how did your companies began their journey to serverless uh, and, and serverless development? Well, if you look at uh, the logistics landscape, logistics domain, um, historically, Lots of uh, logistics um, enterprises used off-the-shelf products. All the parties, all the enterprises in that domain are using the same products. So it becomes really hard to become competitive or to be competitive. And PostNL uh, decided well, to build their own software to get that competitive edge. And when they did, and because they were already heavily involved uh, in, with AWS, they decided that serverless would be the right technology to lower the operational burden and to really focus on the business logic and the well, the competitive advantage that we want to have as opposed to now. That's awesome. And that's what we hear from customers as well, Luke, is that it's that total cost of ownership that includes development time and the operational time that we really, really see uh, help customers and organizations really accelerate once they move to serverless. But I'm going to dive a little bit deeper here with you. Um, what specifically about logistics was a good match for serverless? Is there, is there something about the space that allows uh, allows serverless development to really, really flourish and help you be really successful in the space? Yeah, absolutely. The, one of the um, distinguishing key, uh, the distinguishing facts about logistics is that it is very seasonal. A seasonal in a daily sense, like at night, there is a lot less traffic than uh, than during the day. Uh, also in a weekly sense, like a Tuesday is super busy for us. A Sunday, there's almost nothing. And also in a yearly sense, like uh, December and January are definitely our busiest months. While in June and July, when everybody's going on holidays, uh, we have a lot less traffic. And um, serverless technology really allows us to not worry about that at all because it just scales with, uh, with demand. Uh, and we just build one solution and it works in the middle of December just as well as a Sunday in, uh, in June. And of course, when there is a very low uh, amount of traffic, cost automatically also goes down, which is very important in a low margin business like, uh, like ours. That uh, makes a lot of sense. And I used to run the auto scaling services as, as, as we've chatted about previously in my, in my previous time on AWS. And this is definitely the next level of that where you just don't have to think about scaling policies and everything is pay as you go. That's awesome to hear. 
So you already teed this up earlier, Luke, where you're talking about event-driven architectures and serverless. Um, so I'm, I'm going to dive a little bit in there as well with you. So what does the application actually look like in the logistics space? So what, what can you give us some details about what your serverless architecture kind of looks like? Absolutely, yeah. Um, in fact, we we talk more of a, about a landscape than a application because um, the application landscape, the enterprise landscape itself for parcels consists uh, of dozens of individual applications. And that's also the way we scale our business because a, a team can be responsible for one or two or three applications and not worry about the entire uh, landscape. So it's, of course, a decoupled um, architecture. And But all of those uh, applications, they have to work together to, uh, to achieve well, our business outcomes and our business goals. So we might have applications responsible for sorting parcels in our distribution centers. We might have applications responsible for notifying customers of changes. Uh, and so, well, there are many different responsibilities. And we decided to have the communication between those applications uh, for about 90% event driven. And that really allows us to decouple those applications, develop them independently, scale them independently, um, and has, has yielded a lot of benefit to us. That's awesome. And what I hear from customers, I obviously owning some of our event-driven services in AWS, is that it's not just the architecture that gets decoupled, it's the, it's the human and teams that get decoupled as well, which allows you that organizational agility as well. But as, as, a, as a lead architect, you know, Luke, uh, the, there's no right architectures, there's only the right trade-offs. So just so we can have balanced conversations about event-driven architectures, what were some of the challenges building such a large-scale event-driven architecture at, at Post and Allen? And Allen, how did you overcome some of them? Yeah, well, I think that the biggest challenge is your applications are loosely coupled, um, but that doesn't mean that every application is just entirely free to do whatever they like. You still have consumers, you still have integrations. And um, as um, one application might be sending out an event and they might want to change that event, if they feel that they are, well, let's say entirely decoupled, they, they will just change that event as they see fit and that might lead to downstream incidents. And protecting against that and, um, and making sure uh, that even in a loosely coupled uh, environment, you still get those protections uh, against incidents. Th those are, I think, one of the biggest challenges that we have in, in such a uh, environment. Yeah, definitely. That's what we hear from other customers. Well, decoupling really helps you with speed of innovation and development, but that does mean... <laughs> Uh, at the end of the day, you do need very consistent business results. Um, so using AWS specifically for your event-driven architectures, how did, how did that, using some of our technologies, how did that actually benefit, the, how did the event-driven approach actually benefit post-NL in the end? How did it all turn out with the choice that you made? Yeah. yeah um, so one strategy that we've had for a long time is to have a central integration team. And that is... At a certain scale, you have to. If you ha if you go above, I think five, maybe six applications that are communicating with each other, you want to get rid of those uh, direct integrations uh, between those applications because it becomes unmaintainable. It becomes uh, very difficult to trace where an incident might occur, and it also becomes very difficult to scale again because if you want to have a fan out pattern, you might have to ask the producer to communicate with a new consumer, and then you get stronger coupling again. So by using a central integration team and central uh, integration uh, uh, technologies, we allow producers to send their events to a central integration platform and consumers to subscribe uh, to that platform. And we used to use uh, off-the-shelf products for that as well. Uh, we still do, but the most modern uh, version of that platform is entirely based on EventBridge. And EventBridge is really a key component in our, in our landscape to really, well, decouple 
those producers from consumers and have that integration pattern uh, in, the, in the middle. That's awesome to hear. And uh, hearing it from a customer, that's what, what as the engineering team and the product team, that's what we aspire to do is really be that central clearinghouse for events for companies. And it's awesome to see that being used at your scale. Um, so what else can AWS do, Luke? We, we are, you know, we are, we're here, we're here to make customers' life easier. We're super customer obsessed. What else can we do with your, with our, with the fact that you are partnered with AWS? What help, what else can you do to help you grow? Yeah, well, of course, I'm glad you asked. Uh, what we've seen with AWS is, uh, the services that you offer, uh, we consider building blocks. I mean, it's not a coincidence that these things are in the, uh, in the, on the shelves here behind me, uh, because engineers like building blocks. They like building, uh, new services with those building blocks, but there is a certain limit. Uh, you don't want to do everything, uh, yourself. And I think, uh, you guys came up with the, uh, the term, uh, undifferentiated heavy lifting, and that's the part that you want to solve and, and you do with services like, uh, like EventBridge, but that never, uh, you ne you're never done, uh, solving these problems as new problems uh, occur and markets change and so on. So what we've seen with EventBridge is that it is a really powerful central, uh, integration pattern, but there are some functionalities such as schema validation and certain observability uh, uh, services that are still not there yet. Uh, and that's really where we like our, our partnership with AWS, where we work together. We tell you what our problems and our, our, heavy, uh, our heavy lifting is that we think is the same challenge for every um, uh, large enterprise player with an uh, enterprise um, with an event-driven landscape. And then we work together uh, to get those features in EventBridge, making sure that we don't have to do that heavy lifting again. Well, that's a great point. And we are absolutely a you know, customer-driven roadmap. And so as you remember, in our, uh, we, we chatted at reInvent as well, where we launched uh, EventBridge pipes and schedulers, which were some of the biggest challenges we heard from you and other customers as well. Next up is exactly the things you're talking about, like schema validation and uh, more observability improvements. But the main mission obviously is to give, as you said, give developers more out of the box so they can just focus on that business logic that they need to write. Awesome, and it's great to see that re reaffirmation of our, of our roadmap with you as well, Luke. Thank you, Luke, for, for the amazing chat here. And thank you everyone who joined us for and was listening to us. Enjoy the rest of your serverless innovation day. Thank you for having me.